The carnivore diet is a great way. It's obviously the ultimate elimination diet because you're gonna eliminate everything that's trying to keep you from eating it. Because animals do that with teeth and claws. That's how they try to keep you from eating them. But once they're on the plate, we're kind of past that point. And so all their defenses are gone. And so you don't really have to worry about any inflammatory chemicals or anything being in the meat because that's not how they protect themselves. Plants, on the other hand, that's kind of how they protect themselves, especially their seeds, which contain their DNA, right? Which that's, if that gets crunched up and destroyed, then they're done. Their, their lineage is over. And so plants are very passive in their defense, but yet defensive nonetheless. They don't want to be eaten. And I don't blame them. I don't want to be eaten as either. And so for many people, when they go carnivore, then they can start doing all these nutrition experiments. Because after you've been fatty meat carnivore for a month, you can add back in brassicas and see how you feel. Then you can try nuts, and then you can try all these different things, and you can pinpoint every single thing, even the healthiest of things, like cashews or egg whites or, you know, eggplant, and go, God, that really inflamed me. I, I must not, I, maybe I'm not meant to eat that. Every time I go on YouTube and upload a video or check anything, I look to the side and I see related channels, Dr. Canberry MD. And yeah. so uh, we've had similar subscribers for a while, so it's awesome to connect with you. Absolutely follow you on Facebook and on Instagram. And I think out of all the health influencers, you're growing the fastest. And I just want to commend you because I look up to you as an influencer and like how you're able to build community and influence people. Uh, but you posted a funny story about how you were in Walmart and did they really kick you out? No, Look, they, okay. they, had, they had some stern words, but I didn't get kicked out. So. It, was, it was hard. I was hoping it would be one of those videos where the person's coming mm -hmm. in because I heard over the, over, uh, the overcom, whatever. What were they saying to you? They're just like, oh, what are you doing? You know, like you really shouldn't film in here. So, yeah. okay. And you were just showing basic, because you bring up a good point. And I think the backstory on that was that all the candy and the processed food was at the level of children. Yeah. And as parents, like we're, we're playing man defense all the time. With Absolutely. Food. And we have epidemics of childhood obesity, childhood type two diabetes, diabetes, which used to be unheard of. And now the, there are special clinics just for type 2 diabetics who are pediatrics. And yet we've got floor to ceiling candy at every checkout in every store that a parent could possibly buy food in. And so that just seems, you know, if, if we're really worried about this epidemic of obesity and diabetes, maybe we should change that. That'd be a great first step. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's really tough as a parent, you know, um, and I know you have kids as well, but like school parties, uh, birthday parties, I mean, it seems like at school there's holidays, like every week there's an excuse to just eat junk food. I mean, sure. it's, it's uh, but one of the ways that you've been helping to like inspire people to become little leaders in their own community, which I think is much needed, is you, you talked about this passive resistance. Yeah. How, how can we influence our neighbors, our parents without like diminishing them or, or making them feel bad about what they're feeding their kids? Well, I think the most powerful tool of all is to lead by example, by quiet example, right? And so if you look good and it's obvious that you feel good and your, your kids are excelling and they're athletic and healthy and happy, then, you know, any kind of person and any kind of parent is going to want to know what you're doing. And so once you spark that curiosity in them, once, once you have led by example well enough that you inspire them to ask a question, there's no more open of an opportunity than that. When they've asked you the question, then it's, there you go, you've won. And so I, I, a lot of people, when they come to keto or carnivore or low carb, high healthy fat, they feel so much better. They, they look better, they feel better, and it tends to make you a, a preacher. Right, it tend, you want to reach out, you want to help people. You're like, hey, put down that candy bar. What are you doing, right? But if people aren't ready to hear that, then you can just be annoying. And that doesn't really move the paradigm. That doesn't, that doesn't help anything. And so I try to really get people to understand, you got to wait till they're ready, right? And so you cannot go to your mom and dad's house and say, hey, we got to clean out these cabinets right now. That's never going to work. But when they've seen you lose 45 pounds and when they've seen your psoriasis go completely away and when they see you not popping Tums every five minutes because of your chronic severe heartburn, they're going to say, what are you doing? And there you go. Then the, it's, a, it's an open freeway for you to say whatever needs to be said and actually make a change. 
Have you studied psychology and stuff like that, or you just have influenced patients over the years that you kind of know what makes people tick? I've always kind of been a student of human nature, of anthropology, and so I've always known that there are ways to say things and ways you shouldn't say things. I've also learned a lot of that from my wife as well, <laughs> to, to train me in how to say and how not to say things. But I could, I could tell when I would frame something a certain way to a patient, I could see the door closing. Like, I'm not hearing you at all. This is not touching me in any way. And so <clears throat> picking up on those cues, I can, I can shift and adjust the message to whatever. And so if I'm talking to a teenage girl, then I'm going to talk to her about the benefits of diet for her acne and for her periods and for her weight maybe, right? Because that's what she's going to hear. She's going to hear that. Well, wait, what? It's going to make my acne better? Whoa, what's this diet again? And so she wakes up and she's immediately alert and she's immediately paying attention. Whereas if I'm talking to a 50 year old man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about something completely different because if I don't hit you where you live, you're not gonna pay any attention. Yeah, that's, that's a great example. You know, like it, it, people will pay more to avoid pain than to gain pleasure. So you, you talk about like, so with an older man, you might talk about erectile dysfunction, low sure. energy, libido. Low testosterone how to get rid of that, that beer belly, all that kind of stuff. You know, whatever's important to them, that's what you gotta talk about. You can't talk about what's important to you because they won't hear that. Yeah. It's funny though that, that as influencers, we kind of do that sometimes because we say like, well, this diet worked for me, so you should do it this way, but other people, you have to resonate with them and you're so good at making videos and helping people to hit what they're looking for and then they share it with their friends or family and so forth. And, yeah, some of these Facebook videos, I mean, they're going viral, like in a way that I have not seen. I've been on Facebook for quite a while, so I want to commend you for that. It's really yeah, thanks, cool. Thanks. We, we love doing it, and it, the people seem to love it as well, so it's, it's a win-win. Yeah, and you've been doing this for a while. I mean, yeah. since 2017, and then it really, what, what shifted, would you say, in, in, was it your communication or just finally hit critical mass and more people were talking? I'm not really sure. The first Facebook Live we ever did, I think, we were sitting in a theater parking lot waiting for a movie yeah. because the silly theater near our home they won't open the doors until like 15 minutes before the movie starts which makes no sense right so we were sitting there and she's like well let's just do a, we'll go live and we'll talk about something I'm like okay and so it's basically just us chatting in the car waiting on a movie talking about I think it was reflux heartburn and uh, that that did really well and she's like what in the world there's so many people watch this do you realize how many people we can help by doing this. And plus we just enjoy, you know, talking to each other and talking to other people. So that's what we started doing. And so we never ever talk at people. It's always a conversation. It's a conversation between us and a conversation with them. And I think, I think people hear that and they enjoy that. Everybody likes being chatted with. And nobody likes being lectured to. That's a good point. Yeah, that, the whole engagement. Like you're really engaging with people and everything along those lines. Now, was that before your book came out, Lies My Doctor Told Me? I think so, Around yeah. I think time. it was, yeah. And actually, we started doing a lot of our social media to kind of promote the book, but then it wound up just being its own thing. And we were, like, people were so responsive to the Facebook and the Instagram and the, the YouTube that the book, it's still very important, mm -hmm. but it kind of took a back seat because we were doing all this good work on social media. The book's great, and you, you talk about, I mean, you talk about a lot of different ways, how there's a lot of routines and habits in medicine. And when new ideas are presented, people are really like they put up their blinders and they're really defensive. Uh, the story about Semmelweis, yeah. the Hungarian, can you talk about that? Because a lot of people yeah. don't know that. And so Semmelweis was a uh, young doctor, very intelligent guy. And he, I forget the name of the city, but he went to a city where there were two hospitals where women could deliver babies. And one of the hospitals had such a reputation for being dangerous that women would rather give birth in the street, then go to that hospital. And I think that was actually the wealthy person hospital. And then the other one was for poor people. And it, was, it had a much better rate of the mom and the baby both being able to go home alive. And so Semmelweis couldn't understand what was up with this, why that was the case. And so he started looking and researching. And you have to remember, this was before the germ theory of disease was even understood. Nobody even knew what germs were because I don't even think the microscope was, was around then. And so he had no idea about bacteria, about viruses, about fungus, none of that stuff. They didn't know any of that. He just knew that women died at a much higher rate of childbed fever 
in this hospital, but in this hospital it was very it was much rarer and still probably pretty common back then. But it was it was much less likely to happen in this hospital than that hospital. And so, like any good doctor, he put on his thinking cap and he said, There must be a reason for this. Let me figure this out. And so in the hospital with the very high infectious infection rate, that was the teaching hospital. And so the, do, the, the attending physicians would come straight from the morgue from doing autopsies. Straight from the morgue. And they didn't wash their hands because it was considered offensive, just even the idea that a gentleman could be dirty. And so, even, and so that was the mindset then. I'm a gentleman. I'm a physician. I'm a, I'm a respected, learned member of the community. How dare you say I'm dirty? What are you even talking about, right? And so they would literally take their hands out of a cadaver and go and deliver a baby and without washing their hands. And I know now you're like, how does that even make common sense that you think that's okay, right? You wash your hands before you eat. How could you not? But they, it just didn't occur to them because that wasn't their paradigm. And so he said, you know what? We should, I wonder if we started washing our hands in this little, some sort of little acidic solution. And so he started doing that and his infection rate plummeted. And so if any good doctor again would say, hey you guys, look what I found, look what I've discovered. But all of the physicians who are much older than him, and I talk about in the book, the way you judge someone's stature in the medical community is the length of their white coat, right? And so he was a young doctor and he had a short coat. But these older guys whose coats drug the ground like a, a, a wedding dress train, they, he was not going to tell them anything. They weren't going to listen to him. He was a silly young little punk, right? And so nobody would listen. He wrote papers. He published his research. He had the, the figures. He had the numbers. It was black and white. He was right. But nobody would listen. And so they wound up destroying his medical career. And he wound up in an, in an insane asylum. And during the uh, processing or the booking, he got the crap beat out of him by the orderlies and got cut up and bruised and stuff and wound up getting an infection and dying. Probably died from the, one, of, one of the same bacteria that he was trying to save the women from. And so I think it's such a powerful, poignant example of how you can be absolutely right, but if you don't present it properly, you're not going to help anybody. And so I think that, that story is so important for doctors to understand on multiple levels. Not only do you, you have to put your thinking cap on and not just rest on your laurels. I don't care how long your white coat is. I don't care. You can still be wrong and you can still be egregiously wrong. Right? And so, but then also you have to look, you have to always be learning, always be reading, always be thinking. And, but then when some young punk comes along with an idea, you don't immediately discount that. You give it, you give it its day in court and say, let's think about that. Does that make any sense? Right? And now any of us, just a common man walking the street would know you should wash your hands before you deliver a baby. But back then that was just not on their radar. It's so crazy. I mean, it's such a great story. And do you think in medicine now there's a lot of things that we do, like a similar semi-wise example? Is a ketogenic diet kind of one of these where yeah. a lot of doctors are saying, oh, oh, you shouldn't eat fat? There are multiple examples of this because what was going on back then was not some special stupidity on their part. That was human nature playing out. That was, that's just normal human nature and we have not evolved since then. We are the same humans, right? And so that story repeats itself with different players and different topics every day in medicine. And so um, a great example is the, the helicobacter pylori cause of, of, of gastric ulcers. When the doctor, he was a pathologist, and he, when he first discovered this, he's like, you know, I think this is causing that. They were all laughed at him like he was a, a moron. Like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Everybody knows it's from stress, right? And so he, it took him decades for something that should have been adopted overnight, it took decades for that to take effect in the medical community. And there are still many, many a doctor who thinks that it's just stress. That's what causes ulcers. And yeah, it takes forever. And in many professions like medicine, it's kind of a, a joke, but a, an ironic joke, not a funny joke, that before you can ever change the paradigm, all the old gray-haired men have to die because they run the show, they're in charge, they know everything. And so when a young doctor says, hey, you know what? I think if you change their diet, they might get healthier. All the old doctors just laugh. That's, that's silly. 
You said men, um, and I do have a gender question, because I, I sold supplements to doctors for many years, and I found that generally female practitioners, whether they're nurse practitioners, DOs, whatever, were a little bit more open-minded. Do you think it's a male thing, like this is how we do it? In, in many ways, it is a male thing. Now, I have encountered female providers who are just as closed-minded, don't, don't think that they're incapable of that. They are capable, but on average, on average, it's more likely that a, a female provi healthcare provider will be more open and will go, hmm, that makes a lot of sense. Let me think about that for a minute. Um, and I'm not sure as to why, uh, the sociobiology of that, but all I know is that's, that's the case on average. Mm -hmm. Well, as men, we don't ask for directions. We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out, you know, kind of thing. Um, but this is such a great point. And, and I want to prevent myself and listeners, and I know you do too, from making the same mistakes. If you were to rewind the clock 20 years ago, I would have told you egg whites are so healthy. I would have said oatmeal and egg whites, that's the best breakfast, you have to have this. Yeah. And so I think in my own life right now, I'm like, is this fasting till two or 3 p.m.? Am I gonna look back in 20 years and think that was dumb or eating keto? Do you ever question some of the things yeah, that you're all doing? The time. Yeah. But that's, that is the proper mindset. Because when you're doing that, you're open to other possibilities, to other options, to tweaking this way or that way, right? And we were actually making a, a video, a, a recipe video, and I said as a joke, you know, there are still people who eat egg white omelets to this day, and they think they're doing a great service to their health, right? And they probably are making egg white omelets for their children, thinking that they're really getting them a head start in life, not realizing that they're depriving them of much needed fatty nutrition. Yeah. Well, it comes in the can now. You just pour the egg whites, yeah. liquid egg whites. Yeah. It's so well, convenient. You can buy egg yolks, can you? Can you buy that? <laughs> you don't even need those anymore. <laughs> Chickens throw those things right, out. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's pretty funny. So we all need to have an open mind. I was, as I was telling you offline, uh, David Perlmutter, him and I were just talking about this. So it's constantly evaluating yeah. things like that. Absolutely. And, um, I know you're big on the carnivorous diet. Yeah. Uh, I like people and to just kind of figure out what works with their own body, cycle in and out. Um, do you recommend, because I know it's been very helpful for you, uh, meat only diets and, and I think periodically you throw in vegetables. I do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, have you find that's a great like reset button for folks? Yeah, I think it is. And I think it's a great way to realize that you can tweak your diet and nothing bad's going to happen. And so, but there are actually healthcare providers out there, nutritionists who say, do not eat a month of carnivore. That could be dangerous. Not realizing just the silliness of that. Really? So if, if I were stranded on a desert island and all I had to eat was bacon for a month, I might die? Just in that month, from just doing that for one month, I might die. Like, hmm, okay. And so, but I think that gives people kind of a freedom when they're like, okay, you know, Dr. Barry said I could eat, I could eat ribeye and eggs and cheese and, and butter and bacon for a month. I'm going to do that. But once you do that, I think it frees you in many ways because first of all, everything's back on the table right? Everything's back on the table, which is how it should be all the time. You should be, you should be always be going, hmm, I wonder if it's nuts. I wonder if it's nightshades. I wonder if it's, right? And for some people, it's egg whites. It yeah, literally is for, so for you. Yeah, yeah. And so for so many people, like if we hadn't come across this, this ketogenic way and this low carb, high fat, you'd still be eating egg whites and be chronically inflamed and have no idea that it was the egg whites doing it. Yeah. Does that make sense? It's, it's, oh, totally. Yeah, and so I think the, car, the carnivore diet is a great way. It's, it's all, obviously the ultimate elimination diet because you're going to eliminate everything that's trying to keep you from eating it, right? Because animals do that with teeth and claws. That's how they try to keep you from eating them. But once they're on the plate, we're kind of past that point. And so all their defenses are gone. And so you don't really have to worry about any inflammatory chemicals or anything being in the meat because that's not how they protect themselves. Plants, on the other hand, that's kind of how they protect themselves, especially their seeds, which contain their DNA, right? Which that's, if that gets crunched up and destroyed, then they're done. Their, their lineage is over. And so plants are very passive in their defense, but yet defensive nonetheless. They don't want to be eaten. And I don't blame them. I don't want to be eaten either. And so for many people, when they go carnivore, then they can start doing all these nutrition experiments. Because after you've been fatty meat carnivore for a month, you can add back in brassicas and see how you feel. Then you can try nuts, and then you can try all these different things, and you can pinpoint every single thing, even the healthiest of things, like cashews or egg whites or um, you know eggplant, and go, God, that really inflamed me. I, I must not. I, maybe I'm not meant to eat that. That's a good point. You know, and a lot of us eat the foods that we're actually kind of allergic to or sensitive to. 
um, either because we've overeaten them and then our immune system is making antibodies or whatever. And so I, I, at first when the carnivorous diet was coming on, I'm like, ah, what about the microbiome? What about this? And I was like, Mike, Me too. You're, you're, you're putting yourself in a box. And I would just ask my daughter, I have a six year old, as you know, you met her on the cruise. Mm -hmm. And uh, we put all the vegetables out and meat. Sure enough, what do you think she goes for? For the meat. For the yeah, meat. Absolutely. She doesn't want yeah. to deal with the vegetables yeah. and, and I'm not influencing her anyway. Yeah. And so that to me was like, and, and you know, I love the taste of meat. And I'm like, if humans, if we like it, kids gravitate towards it. Right. How is it so bad? And why do, why, do we have to doc, why do we have to put bacon in vegetables for kids to eat them? Right. Right. Again, it's not that they're bad, but. And I think that's a good rule of thumb to operate on as a parent with the caveat that if it's made in a factory, then that doesn't, that doesn't apply. But if it's a natural whole food and your kids just naturally love that, that probably means something. Good point. Yeah. yeah. Um, so do you encourage folks to cycle through, like so they do a month of carnivore, they lose the weight, they cut down the inflammation, then if they want to have a salad or they want to have this or that, you'll encourage it, but just listen to your body, see yeah, if you get inflamed absolutely. or whatnot. And it's entirely in their hands at that point because once you go carnivore for a month, you're kind of freed from all the shackles of all the dietary foolishness that you've been taught your entire life. And we've all been taught a lot of foolishness, right? By, by authorities who should have known better and by our mom and by our you know, brother and sister and our grandmother who didn't know any better. And so once you've done that, then you're free. And so I, I did the carnivore as a month experiment. I was just playing with it, right? But at the end of that month, I felt so much better. My chronic heartburn, that was, which was 80% better on keto, was gone. Zero, none, and I, I never have heartburn anymore, which is still weird to me, because I had heartburn for from my from probably 30 to 40 every day, every day. I and so when the Nexium drug rep would come, patients never got those samples. I got all those. I took one every day because I had to because I was dying of heartburn. But when I went keto, got much, much better, but still at one, maybe one day a week I'd have heartburn. But with carnivore, zero, it's completely gone. And so that tells me that, that my body likes that. So at the end of that month, I was like, you know what? Why would I go back? I'm gonna do another month. And so I just keep adding months, but I'm, I'm completely open at any point. If I start to not feel good, if I start to whatever, have a rash, anything, joint inflammation, then I'll go, hmm, wonder what I'm missing, and I'll start playing, I'll, I'll tweak my diet. Absolutely. Trying to look for the perfect diet for me and for my ancestry. You know, it's such a great point, and one that I like to encourage all people to do, it, because you're a bigger guy, right? And some people may not eat as much meat as you do. If, if, if a four foot eight, you know, 99 pound female that's not active like you, they may not eat exactly like you. So I love to encourage people to just like try it on, see if it fits and think for themselves. That's, that's all we have as channel. So that's an awesome perspective. Um, but being that you're a bigger guy, you're eating a lot more protein probably than the average Joe, uh, the whole one meal a day thing has gotten pretty popular as of late. I know when I travel, I'm not as active, I do that. What have you found, or does it change with time, like with your meal frequency? It, it depends on the family situation, the social situation, but on the average day, I eat one big fatty meat meal a day. That's what I do now, and I've been doing that for months with carnivore because during the day when I'm at the office, I'm back-to-back, I'm -back booked up, and so I sip on some buttery, salty coffee, and that keeps me from ever being hungry. It keeps me mentally very alert, very awake, very clear, and then when I get home, I have my meal with, with Nisha, but then sometimes she'll come to the office and we'll go have lunch and I'll have some ribs or, or something at the you know restaurant. And if we're in a hurry, I'll go to Wendy's and get two duh, triple cheeseburgers, right? And just eat the, the meat and the cheese and the bacon and leave everything else. And that still works very well for me. Um, but yeah, I, usually one meal a day is what I'm doing. And it's not, it wasn't a goal of mine. It just kind of naturally occurred. Fits with their schedule and everything. On carnivore, and then it fits perfectly with my weekly day-to-day -day schedule. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, do you mind telling folks how old you're going to be on Sunday? I'm going to be 50 in two days, that's one day. Amazing. Yeah. You yeah. look really good. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and your brain's on, your skin's great, you're lean. Yeah. That's fantastic. You know, I do a lot of these interviews, and, and some folks are over 50, and they don't nearly look as good as you can. Well, so thanks. thanks. What you're doing is working, which thanks. is awesome. So I want people, to, they, they can see from that camera, yeah. which is really, really cool. Um, what habit are you doing now that you wish you would have done 10, 15 years ago? Listening to my body and eating the proper diet. And I was just talking to Nisha on the way up here today. I feel better at 50 than I felt at 35. And that shouldn't be something that a, that a human should say. 
That shouldn't be the case what's at all, right? But I think I hear that all the time from pa patients in the clinic and people on social media. It's like, oh my God, I haven't felt this good in 20 years. That means we've been doing a lot of things wrong <clears throat> and it means that we've got a lot of room for improvement. And so if a 50 year old can feel just as good and, and not look too shabby as a 35 year old, then that, that's powerful. I mean, how powerful is that, right? And currently in the United States, we've got all these epidemics of chronic disease, obesity, type two diabetes. Uh, and a lot of people think, oh, diabetes, you know, there's type one and type two. And you, your mind immediate, immediately goes to, oh, it's probably 50-50. But people don't realize that 90 to 95% of diabetes is type two. It's basically self-inflicted by your diet. And when you start to realize, hey, that guy's 50, he looks great, he acts like he feels great, he, he was, I was a pre-diabetic. I had an A1C of 6.2. I mean, I was on the cusp of becoming a type two diabetic back when I almost weighed 300 pounds. Mm -hmm. When I had chronic heartburn, when I had dandruff, when I had my knees in the mornings, I, I walked around like a 80 year old man. That was all self-inflicted, but I had no idea. And I was, a, I was a young doctor, right? And you couldn't tell me. And I was like, what, what? No, come on. I know what I'm doing. I, I took nutrition in medical school, right? I know, I know I'm supposed to eat lots of whole grains, and, and, you know, and jog and, and drink skim milk and eat lots of fruit. And so that's what I was doing. And I was getting fatter and sicker by the month. And now that I've removed all the stuff that does not jive with my DNA and with my gut bacteria, which may be important or may be imminently important, we don't really know yet. I think that's a, a subject that's wide open for so much research to be done. But currently, we don't know much about it. And there are a lot of experts in the field that will pretend to know a lot about it, but currently we don't really know much about that. That's a good point. I want to get into your health stuff, but, but since we're on this topic, sure. that's one reason why the carnivorous diet to me was like, whoa, hold on, how are we fueling the microbiome? And so Exactly. And I was, a, I was very worried about that that first month, and I thought, well, I'm just going to do it for a month, so what's the big deal? I can always go back and I can take some probiotics and I can you know drink some kefir and do all this stuff and fix that if it messes it up. But what most carnivores find is that their gut symptoms either get 90% better or go completely away. And so people with chronic constipation that they took a prescription for gets better and goes away. People with irritable bowel, with Crohn's, with ulcerative colitis, with severe skin disorders, all that stuff just kind of magically goes away. And I know right now for so many people listening, it sounds almost like a panacea. Like, eh, it's snake oil, right? But then you gotta think, well, yeah, but he ain't selling nothing. And so anytime, you know, a guy, a guy who's been to school is telling you, hey, this fixes a lot of stuff, and I also don't have anything to sell you, you should maybe listen to that, right? But then if I say, oh, and I've got this line of supplements, then you're like, well, wait a minute now. But I don't have, I don't have that, and I never will, because you don't need that. You just need to eat real food that's appropriate for your biochemistry and your DNA. That's such a good point. I was thinking about that, the, the, how people are going to monetize the whole carnivorous movement because how many recipes can you create I with meat? you could have meat in a capsule. I don't know, <laughs> but just eat a ribeye. Or a recipe book, it's like rosemary and then bacon. Like, you know what I mean? It's, Salt not, and pepper. The there's end. not too many yeah. options, right? right. Like, and I think that's, uh, there's so many people scrambling, as you know, in the keto space trying to come up with any kind of supplement or any kind of thing where they can cash in on it. And that also, we're right back to human nature. And that's not evil, that's not a conspiracy, that's just what we do. Especially if you're in the US, you're gonna to try to make a profit off something. That's how we're raised, that's what we do. And so I think that in order to get paid for this, your profit's gonna to have to be very passive. You're not gonna have products to sell. You're just gonna teach people how to be healthy. And if you can monetize that, then hallelujah, do it. But there's not gonna be billions of dollars made in the carnivore space. There's not gonna be billions of dollars made in the keto space because you just don't, you don't need products. You just need to eat real food. Yeah, and it's pretty simple. People might fall off and then you can coach them along. There could be some coaching right, programs, right, things right, like right. that, which is pretty interesting. But you know, going back to the whole microbiome thing, because in 2014, I wrote this book, Belly Fat Effect, a lot of information on endotoxin and all of that. So, 
I was just like myopically focused on that research. And so I would oftentimes overcompensate. My wife and I would have all these vegetables because I felt like I had to get strive to get, you know, all these different types of fiber. And sometimes we'd have tons of gas and everything. And so it's funny how, you know, we think we're doing something healthy. Yeah. Um, but then they're out of season. Some of the stuff is shipped all over the country. So it kind of went against what I try to t preach about local. And then since, you know, being inspired slowly over time to eat more meat, you know, carnivorous and cut that out. Uh, digestion is better. So I, it's really, again, I'm not anti-veggie. I'm not saying everyone should do Nor this. Nor am I. But, Nor am yeah. I. Yeah, totally agree. So. And I think some people, depending on where you're, where you're from over the last 20,000 years, I think that some people do better with some veg. Yeah. And I think some people may even do better with a lot of veg. But if, if you know your 23andMe data or your, you know, your ancestral, where you're from, then I think that can point you towards what you should eat. And so Nisha and I did our 23andMe, and it turns out that I'm Nordic, Scotch, Irish, German, and, and more Neanderthal than 97% of the U.S. population. Mm. And so when I got to reading, and I watched a great video by Dr. Michael Eads mm. talking about that we can actually go back and we can do carbon and nitrogen dating on these people, and we can tell you exactly what they ate, whether it was seafood, whether it was mainly veg, whether it was mainly meat. And so Neanderthals and everybody above a certain latitude basically live for 11 months out of the year on fatty meat. And so I'm like, that's, that was kind of the last straw. I'm like, okay, I'm going to try it for a month. Because now that it makes ancestral sense, as well as a lot of people are really doing well on it, I think I'm going to give it a try. But I think people who, whose uh, ancestors are more equatorial, they might do better with more veg, right? And I still think, I think fatty meat is vital for human development and human optimization. Uh, don't get me wrong. So I think meat's important for every single human. But I think some humans do much better with more veg than maybe I would. That's a good point. Um, one of the things that I see is kind of this novelty syndrome where people hear about paleo, they hop on paleo, then they keto, then carnivore. Now yeah. they're going fasting mimicry. Um, what would you say to someone in terms of like, is it important to stick with a program or kind of? I don't think so. And I, I, I totally get your point mm -hmm. that, oh, it's the latest thing. You know, it's the new diet. Oh, I'm going to try that. But I think what the, the, the difference is, is that when you jump on a fad, the fad doesn't really change your life. And so, you know, you might buy that new pair of boots or you might get that new supplement or that new nootropic. But then after three months of buying it, you're like, can't really tell it did anything, right? And so then that's when fads die, is when it's revealed that they're really no better than the old thing you were doing. And, but what happens with keto and carnivore is these people, it changes their life. Like it wakes them up mentally and physically, and they are back to a, to a degree of optimization that they never hoped to attain again. And so I think that's not a fad, right? And so it's hard to know when you're right in the middle of a situation, are we chasing fads or are we evolving our knowledge base and going, and what I personally believe is that we're rediscovering the proper human diet is what we're doing. And so for the last 70, 80 years, we've been preached to by all these associations and organizations and all these doctors in long white coats who thought they knew based on some fallacious research what we should and shouldn't eat. Turns out they were probably completely and totally wrong. And so I don't think this is a fad. But I could be wrong, couldn't I? Yeah, I could be totally be wrong, and I always have that, that doors open for me all the time because I'm, I'm a lot like Dave Feldman in that respect. I'm happy for you to prove me wrong because I just learned something. And so either way, I win. Either I'm right and I win, or you teach me something and I get smarter and then I win. So either way, I'm happy, for, I'm happy to be shown to be wrong. I'm not opposed to that whatsoever. But I, 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 I see people trying to do that and having trouble with that. Not me personally, but these, these movements that we're having kind of in this dietary grassroots revolution. It's an evolution or a revolution, however you want to look at it. But this is coming from the bottom up. Fads usually come from mainstream marketing and media and go down to the masses. But this is literally simmering and boiling in the masses and boiling to the top. And so I, I really think it's hard when you look at this objectively to call that a fad. Yeah, it's a good point. I, I agree. I don't think it's fat. I mean, if you look from an evolutionary perspective, whether it's carnivore, keto, uh, eating seasonally, I mean, that's what humans, that, that was the only option, right, right. that you would do. Right. Um, so anyway, and so when I see vegans, vegetarians say keto is bad or carnivore is bad, 
I have my own things that I like to say, but I'm curious, what, like, what would you say? Because there, there's uh, a few influential vegan folks that are anti-keto, yeah. and I'm like, but yet they're athletes, and they're probably burning ketones when they're out. Exactly. What yeah. do you say to them? And Well, there's, there's two schools who are really aggressive at trying to push back, and that's our vegan brothers and sisters, who we love and respect, and then also the calories in, calories out people. Right, the the calorie restriction people, you got to burn more than you eat, or you uh, you have to be in a calorie deficit, or you cannot lose weight. And so I think that we've proven beyond doubt with with the science and with the common sense that those that's that's wrong. That's not true at all. Weight loss and reversing things like type two diabetes, it's all hormonally related, and you basically hack your hormones by the food you eat. And you can hack them in the wrong way or you can hack them in the right way. And so I think that you will see over the coming months and, and years the uh, calories in, calories out people starting to recede and starting to lose followers and starting to kind of become um, kind of peripheral because it obviously, so here, like for example, the calories in, calories out model of weight loss has been around for a hundred years. And so if it worked, there wouldn't be an obesity epidemic right now, unless you want to just look at the majority of the U.S. populations and, and say you guys are gluttons and, and you're sloths and you suck and you're, you're, you're lazy and you just want to lay on the couch and eat M&Ms all day. That's what's wrong with you. It's your fault. Now, if you're that guy and you like to say that to people, then I guess, I guess there's money to be made there. But when you say to people, no, actually, there's nothing wrong with you you're not broken, you're not defective, you're not weak. It's actually the diet you were taught to eat that's keeping you beat down. And so if you'd like to rise up and kind of reclaim your human glory, feed your body what it needs and take the slow poisons out of your diet and magical things happen. Mm -hmm. Great point. Um, as a physician, you probably have seen this many times. I mean, as a kid, we, we you know, you, you see an overweight child, you're like, oh, they're lazy, whatever, sloth, things like that. They, the, those thoughts get tossed around and things. But w when I was a nutritionist with an MD, uh, internal medicine doctor, our gallery in Denver, I would eat, meet, meet with these overweight people and they were very motivated, doing everything they could. They were totally opposite. And we have mutual friends that, that are overweight that are very motivated, some of the most driven people we know. You've seen that in the clinic. So. Uh, um, this hormonal thing, there's other microbiome, who knows what else, but that, I think anyone should wash that thought out because it's really... Absolutely. Yeah, well, first of all, it's offensive yeah. to the majority of people who are honestly trying the best they know how and failing. And so I can remember one lady in particular who broke down in tears in my office and she said, I have tried Weight Watchers six times. Now, if she weren't motivated why would she have done it six times? Something that obviously didn't work the first time or the second or the third. Weight Watchers have been around since what, 1969? And so if Weight Watchers worked, sorry if I'm stepping on a, an, you know, an advertising oh, toe, okay. but it obviously doesn't work or we wouldn't have an obesity epidemic in the United States. But we do and it's getting bigger every day, so obviously that don't work. So these people, you're right, they're very motivated. They're trying everything they know. And for some people, all they know is what they see advertised on TV. And they're like, oh, Weight Watchers has got a new program. I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to try it again because maybe I wasn't doing it right, right? And so you're right. These people are motivated. They want to be, who doesn't want to be healthy, right? And so it's my contention that the human body, the human being is made to be happy and healthy and fit and motivated, all that stuff is hardwired into us or we wouldn't rule the planet, right? We wouldn't be here, right? We wouldn't today. be here, first of all, but yeah. secondly, we wouldn't be the preeminent species on this planet. We kind of we kind of run the show. And the reason is, is that we're, we're built so well, so effectively. I mean, we're, we're, we take over everything. And sometimes that's looked at as a negative trait and sometimes it is, right? Like, oh, I've got a country, I'm gonna take your country too. And that's just kind of how we are. And so to act like that a large percentage of us are just fat and lazy and stupid, very disrespectful, very, very dishonest in my opinion. No, they've got the same DNA as you do, Bubba. They're just eating the wrong food, right? And they're living the wrong lifestyle. And once, once you remove the slow poison and once you actually give them the tools and the knowledge that they need, they flourish. I see it every day. I have people drive from four or five states over to see me at the office just to tell me, look what you've done to me. This is my before picture and this is me now. I feel better. I had a guy who drives around the country. He said, I feel better at 75 than I felt at 50. 
And so that makes me feel hopeful, right? Like, oh, good. So 75 ain't that bad. And so, but yeah, I hear that, that story repeated every day. It's like, I wasn't lazy. I wasn't stupid. I wasn't, I wasn't a glutton. I just didn't know what to do. Nobody would tell me the right steps to take. And I think once you tell those people, this is, you do this, 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 and this, it worked. And then it keeps working. And then it's sustainable. It's effortless. It's delicious. Why would I not do that? And so I don't, every diet that I've ever recommended in my medical practice. And so when I first started, I would recommend the American Heart Association diet, the ADA diet, the Weight Watchers, Jenny Craig, join the gym. Oh, and I used to literally say the phrase, it's easy, you just gotta burn more calories than you eat. I would say that to people, right. how ignorant I was, right? And they're like, looking at me like, dude, you don't think I thought of that? You don't think I've tried that 50 times? It doesn't work. And they're right, it doesn't work, right? You're right, yeah. I think that there's a few people in the fitness space that are big into this calorie counting thing. And I, I feel like they're digging, it's the sunk cost bias because yep. they've been promoting this forever. They can't back out of the hole now. So they That's just right. keep digging, digging, they're digging. Stuck. Yeah, and, and so either they're gonna admit they're wrong like I did. I, I was an idiot. I was an ignorant, fat, lazy, mentally lazy, miserable doctor but I kept saying the same crap over and over to the patients as they would glance down at my belly and go, oh yeah? Okay, so if I wanna look like you, I should do what you say, and that's, I weighed almost 300 pounds. Yeah. What do you and, weigh now for reference? Uh, 235. Okay, yeah, wow, 235. that's a big swing. Yeah, yeah, and so, <laughs> yeah, and I, but I was, I was entrenched then as well, because that's all I knew. That was my only tool I had, right? My only bullet in my gun. And so I didn't know what else to tell them. So I would just keep repeating that thing over and over. And I see people get in slap fights on Twitter every day. It's like, no, you just have to be in a calorie deficit. And I just, I don't, I never argue, but I think, do you not think they've thought of that? <laughs> they've thought of that. We've known about that for a hundred years. That's not working. So it, it, it's going to be very interesting to watch the migration of these people. How are they going to justify that and shift their paradigm without just saying I was completely and totally wrong. Mm -hmm. They rely upon a few metabolic ward studies that are short term. Right. And what's cool is there's a lot of studies that are comparing, is it the calories or is it the hormones? They're doing steady state calorie restriction versus this intermittent fasting approach. And uh, I know one university I've been going back and forth with an author out of the UK somewhere in England. And then uh, I think David Ludwig just published something a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So it's really cool. It's like, all right, the data is coming out it's in coming. humans long term. Yep. So we can stop arguing over this because it gets silly. And some of the people are really like, you know, they're out there. Very aggressive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's really funny. Well, you mentioned that you were on PPIs, proton pump inhibitors. inhibitors. A lot of people struggle to get off that psychologically and yeah. physiologically. How did you make that transition? Well, I just stopped needing them because I had changed my diet to the point where I wasn't inflaming my gut anymore. And who knows what else? Is there a microbiome connection? Perhaps. Do we know for sure? No, we don't, right? And so obviously more research needs to be done on that. I have no doubt about that. But for whatever reason, I just stopped needing them. And so people don't take medicine because they wanna take medicine. They take medicine because they have symptoms. And they take medicine because their doctor told them they needed it, right? And so I have so many people who come to me for refills and in a very busy, busy medical practice, it's very easy just to click the button and shoot in a refill. But if I say to them, now, do you need this Nexium every day? And they're like, well, I don't know, I guess. I'm like, well, I'll tell you what, go to every other day. Start taking it every other day. And then if you don't have any more symptoms after a month of that, try going to every third day. And so I kind of build in a, a wean down schedule without them even knowing that's what I'm doing. And so, because people are happy not to pay a copay, right? They're happy not to take a pill every day. And so once they're able to go every other day, they're like, hey, I didn't die. I'm not having this severe pain I used to have, but they're also eating keto or they're also eating carnivore. And so then they just stop it and they don't need it anymore. And they're ecstatic about that. They're not sad. They don't miss their daily pill. They're happy that they've got one less shackle holding them back. That's a good point. I mean, long term, there, there's some pretty negative research coming out on PPIs. Even one paper, I think Alzheimer's, where eating Absolutely, dementia long yeah. term. Your risk in. of all that, Alzheimer's dementia, your risk of pneumonia, your risk of brittle bones, huge risk factor for osteoporosis, and then uh, cancer, all kinds of different things go, go up remarkably when you take, uh, when you mindlessly take a proton pump inhibitor for years and years and years. Your stomach acid is there for a reason. It's there for a reason, right? We have one of the most acidic stomachs in the mammalian family. 
Most mammals don't have a 1.5 stomach pH. And so first of all, that must mean something. We must have that for a reason. And secondly, you shouldn't block that acid. That's probably there because we need it. Interesting. You know, it's funny, like uh, your, your colleagues, medical doctors of all sorts, talk about uh, evidence-based medicine. We've got to practice evidence-based medicine. Yeah. And if you look at the evidence and I think the indication of PPIs, it's very short term, like two to three That's weeks, right. right? That's exactly Yet all right. these patients. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and doctors love, and, and it's true evidence-based medicine is very powerful. And it's a very real thing. And we should totally abide by meaningful, real evidence-based medicine. But what most people don't realize and some providers, I think, don't realize, is there's a hierarchy to evidence, right? The randomized, double-blinded control trial, that is the cream of the crop. That's the best evidence there is, right? Because you blind the researchers so their bias doesn't creep in, and you double-blind everybody so nobody knows what anybody's getting. That's real meaningful research. And then, the, you know, then we go down to cohort studies, observational studies, and then the very last rung of the ladder is expert opinion. Right? And so, so many doctors don't realize that the evidence that they're practicing is based exclusively on expert opinion. So basically, you got a, a bunch of guys with long white coats in a room in Harvard, and they said, well, I think you should, I think it's fine to take a proton pump inhibitor. I think it's no big deal. Is, has, has, any, has anybody done the randomized controlled trial of, let's put 5,000 people on a PPI every day for 25 years and let's not do it to these people and let's see what happens. That's never been done, right? You can't do that because they wanted to get that drug on the market and make billions of dollars. And so, so many drugs that we take every day, when you look it up in the, in the PDR or one of our electronic references, mechanism of action, unknown. Literally says unknown or not known or not fully understood. So we're prescribing this potentially deadly biochemical to people and there's not been a single long-term randomized double-blinded trial for this drug. Maybe there's been an 18-month study, maybe a 24-month study. That's it. That is it. For every drug on the market today, that is it. And so many drugs, if you have a, a side effect or a complication, the drug manufacturer actually gives you an 800 number and you call the drug manufacturer and you're like, wait a minute, what? And so do you think it's, you think it's in their best financial interest to go, you know, we got 82,000 calls last year about this drug. Maybe we should do something about that? No. Only when, when enough people are harmed that the federal government gets involved, then something might happen. And often all they'll do is put a black box warning on the, the, in the literature, which means you can still prescribe it. And it says, oh, this may kill your patient in the black box, but then nobody's died because you haven't done these long studies, so doctors keep prescribing it. It's crazy. I mean, I think we're, we all joke about it if we watch the Super Bowl or Sunday Night Football and all the warnings after a certain medication yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> come up may cause death, irritable, you know. Yeah. I think the only one the, uh, the, the erectile dysfunction drugs like to talk about is this may cause an erection that will last three hours and all the guys are looking around like, what is this thing? <laughs> exactly. You know, that's the only positive side effect. But yeah, it's this polypharmacy too. And, it, and just as a side note, I love that you're able to talk about this uh, um, because a lot of people I think get stuck in a box. They talk about keto and that's all they know, but you have videos on prostate health, on yeah. thyroid, Hashimoto's, diabetes. Yeah. Like you're talking about the whole body and keto right. is a piece of that, a big part of it. Right. But you like, you're, you're striving to get people to improve their, the health of their entire yeah. body. And I try to reach out while well, like with the YouTube videos, I'll try to hit a certain topic and then I'm like, oh, and also you should eat this diet as well, right? Because that, in my opinion, that is the appropriate human diet. And so not only do they fix the, their sleep or their prostate or their reflux, but they also start to eat a better diet. And I think that's a win for them and for me. Yeah. Uh, are you cool to, switching gears a little bit, talking sure. about the thyroid? Yeah. Uh, we've talked about this before on a Facebook Live with Dr. John Lemansky. A lot of people have this perception that if they fast or they go keto, their thyroid's going to get all out of whack. And I think it gets, it's concerning for people. They're like, oh, I don't want to do keto because the paleo mom said you shouldn't do it because right. your thyroid. Right. Exactly. So yeah. what's up with that? So the thyroid gland is, a, is eminently important in human physiology, first of all. It's a very important gland. Uh, some people call it the master gland, right? It's also very poorly understood by most doctors. Thinking about, um, I used to be a carpenter and a cabinet maker, and so when you cut crown mold to put up, you have to cut it upside down and backwards 
to get the cut to be right. And any carpenters out there, they'll be like, yeah, he's right, you do have to do that. And so I talk about thyroid because you have to think about it upside down and backwards. And so if you've got a, so many doctors, have, I have had people come to me and say, my doctor said I've got hyperthyroidism and I look and their TSH is high. And so he's so uneducated or he's forgotten what he was taught, he thinks that a high TSH means hyperthyroidism. And it's like, wow, yeah, I'm glad you came to see me because he wasn't gonna, he was about to not help you at all with your thyroid issue. And so I think the most important question that any of us should ask is why do we have all these thyroid conditions? I think that's a huge question that needs to be addressed with research because I don't know the answer currently. I don't know why. I'm, obviously it's modern lifestyle and diet, but I don't know exactly why. But thyroid, hypothyroidism and, and autoimmune thyroiditis is becoming way too common. And I think that's a big problem that some researcher needs to tackle and figure out why. But that's not my job. My job is to, to help them optimize their thyroid when they're sitting in front of me and then to make videos and help people understand their thyroid and, understand, and, and to help them to help their doctor understand their thyroid because many patients have taught doctors about thyroid because doctors, it, you just hear you write that, you're done, or I send you to endocrinology. That's the extent of most doctors' thyroid treatment. Which is scary. I mean, considering the prevalence of Hashimoto's, at least in women and everything like that, do you recommend like a micronized T3 or a T3, T4? Color? Yeah, I use only desiccated mm -hmm. natural thyroid. That's what I use. I use Armor, I use NP, I use WP, Nature, uh, and Urfa in Canada because those, those contain, so everybody knows about T3 and T4, but they forget there's also a T0 and a T1 and a T2, and there's also calcitonin. All that is what the thyroid's about, right? And so if you give somebody the synthetic thyroid replacement, it's fake T4. That's all it is. And it's not even real T4, it's just fake T4. And so you're ignoring all the other T's and the calcitonin and the iodine of the situation. And so the thyroid's much more complicated than that. And so giving them a fake T4 replacement, you might improve their symptoms, but when we start looking at long-term health and we start looking at optimization, you're not really helping that patient at all. And so the thyroid is eminently important. Iodine is a big deal that's far under addressed in my opinion. There's virtually no iodine whatsoever in the average American diet. And so, so many people, when they just start using an iodine supplement like Lugol Solution or, or one of the others, they magically feel better. They're like, no, you don't understand. It's like a light came on in my brain. These are ex quotes that I've heard from patients. I've had cold hands and cold feet for the last 20 years. I don't have that anymore. It's like a veil has been lifted off my eyes. It's like I can think clearly now, all this stuff I hear. Because doctors think, and most patients think, that there are only iodine receptors in the thyroid gland. That the thy thyroid, that's all that uses iodine. Not true at all. There are iodine receptors in the brain. There are iodine receptors in the gonads, in the breast tissue, all over the body. The entire body needs iodine. And, but most doctors have no clue about that, and so that basically throttles any effect they can have on the patient long term. Such a good point. I have iodine in my bag over there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just love it. I mean, yeah, we always company, travel with it. It's good, especially when you're traveling too, because um, I, I mean, it's good to displace the halogens, like if you're getting like filtered water or Absolutely. unfiltered water Absolutely. with fluorine and right. chloride and all right. that. Yeah, uh, and so many myths about the thyroid gland. And so the, I've actually got a YouTube video about this one. Oh, brassicas. If you eat too many brassicas, it could cause hypothyroid. People actually who, who have initials after their name actually say that out loud on social media. Ridiculous, okay? And so I actually, when I was doing the research for that video, there, the only research that even speaks to that is there's one case study from Asia where this little Asian lady, and who knows what her other health issues were, right? She was eating six or seven pounds of um, bok choy, every day that was she just lived on bok choy and but and they discovered she had hypothyroidism and so the doctor wrote up this case study which on the hierarchy of of meaningful research is just above expert opinion it's just a case study of one person but it, it was such a weird thing and it was such a, it's one of those concepts that you go huh maybe there's something to that and so even even authorities in this space if they don't say brassicas might lower your thyroid function, they'll still say, and then you know there's the brassica thing, so you know, I don't know, and, but even mentioning it plants it, right? And you planted the seed, and now they're gonna worry about too much broccoli. 
No, there's zero research that shows that brassicas have any bad effect on your thyroid function whatsoever. There's just none. And then there's the, the, the myth that, oh, if you eat too low carb, you can exacerbate Hashimoto's. And there's even the, the myth that if you take an iodine supplement, it could cause your, your thyroiditis to get worse. It completely ignoring all the other tissues that need iodine, right? And also ignoring the fact that you're probably deficient in iodine. And also ignoring the fact that if you take too much iodine, if you have normal kidney function, you just urinate it out. It's nothing. Right? It's like taking too much magnesium or too much potassium. It means nothing if you have normal renal function. And so there's so many myths around the thyroid and it's because it's so poorly understood. Yeah, is that a, a topic that you love to study? I mean, in addition to keto, you have a big passion for Hashimoto's and thyroid yeah, I love health. Love the thyroid yeah. and everything that pertains to it. Super interesting. Well, you know, some of the people that, that say keto is bad because the thyroid, they, they look at, uh, because it affects the thyroid and all that, they'll look at the epilepsy research in children. They don't understand that some of the anti-epileptic drugs that the kids are on affect the thyroid. So they kind of uh, they kind of blur, oh, we'll see, keto is bad. Be like, well, those drugs are inherently. And so those children that are on a therapeutic ketogenic diet are basically guzzling vegetable oil to, to get their fat macro up, right? And so if you, if you know much about the ketogenic way of eating at all, you know that vegetable oils are not a part of that because they're very inflammatory. And so these children, they have more uh, fractures and they, have, they can have thyroid issues, but it's not because of the low carbohydrate nature of the diet. It's because of the type of ketogenic diet they were put on. It's a therapeutic diet. And back then they didn't know vegetable oils were inflammatory, so they would just let them drink canola or drink corn oil or drink soybean oil. And so that's how they got their fat macro up to keep them from having seizures. And it does work. It keeps them from having seizures. But you can also feed those children a healthy ketogenic diet. And they won't have seizures, but also they won't have those other problems. Yeah, I was diving into some of that research because I knew we'd, we might go there. Uh, and also, I mean, I think this is my perspective. If you're on the diet, you're losing weight on a ketogenic diet because you're overweight, right? And you're like, well, what about my thyroid? Well, how's your energy? How's your bowel movement? Are you used to have cold hands and feet? Like if your T TSH drops or increases slightly, but right. your symptoms yeah. don't exacerbate, then who gives it? Right, and one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that your TSH fluctuates daily. It can go up or down three or four points from a day-to-day -day basis. But nobody knows that because we've never done the study where we check your TSH every day for three months and just see what it does. And you would see that daily fluctuation of a point or two or three. But, and so then if you get your TSH checked after you've been keto for three months and your TSH went down or went up, you're like, oh, look what it did. But that's not really, a, that's not an important marker for thyroid disease. The TSH is one of the least important markers, right? And especially for thyroiditis, it's essentially meaningless. And so, so many people are running around with severe thyroiditis, Hashimoto's or otherwise, and they have no idea because all their doctor checked was a TSH. And so then to, to come back around and say, oh, the TSH went up three points, this is a bad diet for you, you should stop it. It's just, it's kind of silly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. You mentioned TSH and then you shared your labs a few months ago. Yeah. And uh, I was really impressed your testosterone was in the 600s and, and free. And I just had a client this morning, I was reviewing his labs and his told, he's only 34. Big muscular guy, strong guy, I was expecting like 900, right? And his T was in the 400 range, yeah. his free was two. Yeah. And I was like, man, that is crazy. So uh, did you notice a difference with going back to the carnivorous diet? Um, I know Sean Baker talks about this a lot, like he just, free testosterone, you know, more recovery, more kind of yeah. youthful vigor. Yeah. When I went from the paleo diet, which I was on for several years, to the ketogenic diet, I kind of felt like that I put on muscle. And it's because when you go keto, you're going to just naturally eat more fatty meat, right? And, but I, I don't know. Everybody said, oh, you look great. You must be working out. And I'm like, no, I don't, I don't work out. But then when I switched to the carnivore diet about 10 months ago, I, I had a noticeable increase in muscle mass. And, I, and I'm like, uh, I don't know what's going on. And Nisha's even like, are you doing push-ups behind my back or something? And I'm like, no. And so I think that, like, like I said earlier, I think we're built to be happy and healthy and vigorous and smart and strong. Look at the lion on the savanna, right? He lays around and sleeps for three days. Yet when he gets up and walks, he's rippling muscle. He doesn't work out. He doesn't lift weights. He sleeps all the time until it's time to go hunt. But when he eats the proper diet, 
that's his body stays there. That's where he stays. That's his normal. And, and my contention is that's the human normal. Our normal is to be vigorous and healthy and strong and smart. But when you introduce a slow poison like grains or like sugars or like vegetable oils, we start to get sick and slow and stupid. And so I think that when you start to refeed the human animal what it's supposed to eat, it just naturally kind of goes back to a healthy, youthful, strong, smart, normal. That's normal. The normal that we've had for the last 50 years ain't normal. It's, it's, it's the normal that you have when you eat slow poison three or four or five or six times a day. Good point. There's that book, Folks, This Ain't Normal. Um, he, he's a farmer, I'm forgetting his name, in uh, North Carolina. He was in a lot of the different Fed Up and those different types of movies, but he talks about how, uh, you know, like kids, for example, don't go out in the farm anymore. We're, we're throwing out the egg yolk and having the whites. Right. So yeah, this isn't normal. So I've read some research that age-related declines in testosterone are not normal. That if you look at folks in un unindustrialized parts of Africa and so South America, you know, like you mentioned that patient that's 75, their testosterone might be five, 600. Right. Um, but are you seeing like young men like low teen? Oh yeah, when I see a patient who's eating the standard American diet or the stupid American diet, whichever you want to call it, invariably they come in and I had one guy, he was in his early 20s and he, his chief complaint was, I was watching TV and a cat food commercial came on and I teared up and started crying at a cat food commercial. And I'm like, oh, you got low T. I don't even have to check your labs. And it turns out he was 22, 23. His total testosterone was 220 or something. And so he had effectively become his grandmother, right, as a 22-year-old. And so when he, was, he was weak. He was pale. He, he just looked sad mentally. And then just from just looking at him, he just looked sad, like a sad, weak little fella. And so we started fixing his diet and we also optimized his testosterone. And six months later when he came back, I literally did not recognize who he was. And so like five minutes into the interview, I'm like, mentally, I'm like, you're that guy. Holy crap. Yeah. yeah. And he was a completely different human. Six months later, after he had stopped eating Cheetos and drinking Pepsi all day and had started optimizing his testosterone, he was the human he was meant to be. He was back to just that normal 23-year-old, good, healthy, good-looking, strong, vigorous guy. That's how we're supposed to be. And once you get the slow poison out of your diet and optimize whatever needs to be optimized, this is normal. Yeah, such a good point. I, I think hormones are such a big deal for self-image, self-esteem, how we perceive the world around us and all that. Uh, but let's kind of finish up on diabetes. I know it's a huge passion for yes. of yours. and. And being in the South, I've heard you say, you, know, out, you practice just outside of Nashville. Yeah. The, the county that you practice in is one of the most unhealthy counties in the whole state of Tennessee? In the whole state, that's right. Yeah, there's, what, 99 counties, and I think it was 97. And so at that point, I was like, okay, either I'm doing a terrible job, or this is just a, uh, why? Why is that so, right? And so, like Semmelweis, I said, there's gotta be a reason. What is the reason or reasons? And so, at that point, the more I read, and I started looking at other parts of the country, and they were sicker than my county. And I said, you know, this is ridiculous. We've got an American Diabetes Association. We've got all these endocrinologists. We've got a, a, di a type two diabetes medication commercial on TV every 10 seconds. But yet the epidemic of type two diabetes is skyrocketing and not even slowing down at all. For a minute there, there was a, a, a blip in the, in the curve and everybody's like, oh, see, it's getting better. But then the next year it was going right back up again. And so, yeah, and that, that really pissed me off. And I'm like, this is ludicrous. We're, the, we're one of the most developed countries in the world and yet we're sicker. We're on all these shots, all these pills in eating this diet that's supposed to be helping but is actually not helping at all, this is ridiculous. There's room here for improvement. And so I kind of made it my mission to, to just at that point single-handedly try to do something to break the back of the, of the twin epidemics of obesity and type 2 diabetes. And so many of my videos are about that because it's ridiculous. When a doctor says, oh, you have type 2 diabetes, that's a permanent condition. All you can do is take pills and shots and insulin and eat the American Diabetes Association diet. That's terrible. That's terrible advice. That should be malpractice. And I think five years from now, we'll be looked at as malpractice. But right now, it's the state of practice. And so 
That's it. I can't, I can't rest. I can't not make videos and not go live while that kind of foolishness is going on out there. And people's moms and dads, people's grandparents are being given that information. People are losing their grandpa. They're losing their mom. They're in the nursing home. They had a stroke or they're dead or they've lost a, a foot or they're blind now. Can't go out and play with the grandkids because I'm blind because of this damn type 2 diabetes. That just infuriates me. This is, all of this is unnecessary. All of this is, can be prevented easily. And I'm not talking about being prevented with $5,000 a month of medication. I'm talking about just stop eating the slow poison that your doctor told you to eat. Mm, such a good point. Uh, I was looking at the American Diabetic Association website because when I was doing research for the book Belly Fat Effect, I remember they recommended, it was very high carb, like processed food, and it's slowly going more yes. low carb, very, very delicately. They're not using keto low carb wordage, but. Yep. Yep. Yeah, they're very slowly backing away. And one day I was making a video about it and I was gonna post a couple of pictures on their website of recipes that they recommended. And so there's this breakfast, it was, it was, it was whole wheat pancakes, orange juice, and I forget what else, I don't know. And whole wheat toast probably, and maybe one tiny little piece of meat, maybe an egg white. And so when I clicked on it, it was gone. It was not there and I'm like, Oh, okay, excellent, very nice. And I have also been watching the ADA website and they're very slowly starting to say, you know, you shouldn't eat, too, it, it, carbohydrates are not bad, but you shouldn't eat too many of them. You should eat, try to eat fewer carbohydrates, yeah. And they don't say, you know, you only have three macronutrients. You have fat, protein, and carbohydrates. And so if you eat less carbohydrates, you gotta eat more of something. And so not once have they said you gotta eat more fat, but they, they are starting to say you shouldn't eat too many processed carbohydrates. And that makes me happy. Yeah, it's, it's gonna be interesting seeing how they're gonna back people <clears throat> on this one yeah. for sure. And I predict there'll never be a press release where they say, yeah, we were wrong about all that. That's never gonna happen because that's not human nature, right? So they're gonna slowly back away. They're gonna slowly take down recipes. They're gonna slowly take pictures off the website. And 10 years from now, when you go to the American Diabetes Association, if they still exist, what you'll see is a bunch of pictures of meat and green vegetables. And that's all you'll see on their website. Yeah, which is pretty funny. It's, uh... And they're, they're going to say, oh, well, we've been recommending this whole, this whole time. Right. Yeah. Of course, I mean, everybody's known that low carb is the way to go. Yeah. Really? That old oh. management, they, they promoted that stuff, yeah, not exactly us. Exactly right. Yeah, and it's going to be very interesting as a study in human nature and anthropology how they're going to gently pull away from that without accepting blame because that's also human nature. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, so I know you have a lot of great videos, but if there was like three or two, you know, four things that, that someone that had prediabetes or had a, an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent with diabetes, what are the, I mean, we already talked about the diet and yeah. stuff like that. Is that the most important thing in your eyes? Oh, absolutely. Diet, by, diet is the only thing you should focus on because and another, I'm a big proponent of the 80-20, right? I want you to focus all your money and all your time and all your energy on what's gonna give you 80% of your benefits. Don't waste your time. And so I have all these people come in and are like, well, I paid $85 for this probiotic. And I'm like, I'm not talking bad about the probiotic, but you're focusing on the wrong thing, right? And so another great example is I've got a shotgun and I've got a BB gun, Mike, and I'm gonna shoot you with one of them. Which one do you pick? Duh, right? But so many people are focusing on the BB gun and ignoring the shotgun that's pointed right at their face. And so I try to tell people it's very easy to fix your diet. There are really three basic first steps. Step one, get rid of all sugars of all kind, even locally sourced and even organic. Organic locally grown honey is just as bad as honey from Walmart when it comes to type two diabetes. Mm -hmm. Next is to get rid of all grains. And all grains are just as bad as any other grain, whether it's whole wheat or whether it's bunny bread, get rid of it. Get rid of oats, get rid of corn, get rid of the other grain, right? You want to get, you don't, rice. You don't want any grains in your diet if you're a type two diabetic because they convert immediately to sugar as soon as you digest them, right? And then step three is to get rid of all vegetable oils, whether it's canola, corn, soy, any of those guys, safflower, they gotta go. You've gotta use real fats when you cook, like butter and like lard and like ghee and like avocado and olive. Those are real oils that humans have been using for thousands of years. And so if, you're, if any of your food is made in a factory, if it comes in a cardboard box, if it has more than three ingredients, it's garbage. It's gonna make your diabetes worse, throw it away. And so with those three steps, most people can, can improve their, their A1C score by 50%. Just by getting rid of those three things out of their diet, you're gonna naturally replace those things with real food. And then you're gonna get healthier. 
Great point. I, I got a DM the other day from someone and she said, um, I didn't know who this person is. You know, you get these random messages, I know. Uh, hey Mike, I, I was, I'm on this uh, Herbalife or some sort of protein thing for weight loss and detox and stuff, and I just wrote back, it's, it's probably crap. What do you think about all these powders and potions? And yeah, they're all crap. And so what, what my usual answer is, hey, what do you think about this protein powder or this collagen powder or this branch chain amino acid powder? My reply is, eat meat. Two words, eat meat. And so a lot of times they're like, they get a little triggered by that because it's like, well, I, I thought you were going to help me. I'm like, I did. But then also some people are like, oh, yeah, meat's got all that stuff, doesn't it? It's got all the amino acids. It's got lots of protein. It's got all the, all the amino acids. All the essential amino acids are in a steak or in an egg. And so, yeah, stop that. Stop buying pills and powders and potions. And I'll tell you what I think is going on. In America, we've been trained. If you have a problem, you go buy a product to solve that problem. That's how we think. And that's kind of the Western way of thinking, right? Whereas a more Eastern way of thinking would be, if you have a problem, what can you remove from the situation to fix the problem? And so I think that we're, we've gotten too gung-ho with our Western way of thinking. I need a powder, I need a pill, I need a protein bar, I need a, a prescription. No, you just need to remove the slow poisons. Step one, sugar. Step two, grain. Step three, vegetable oils. When you remove those things, your health gets magically better. You don't have to go out and buy more products to replace those products. You just have to eat real food. Such a good point. Yeah, and it, you know, people like ourselves and your wife, you know, we're, we're used to this, going to healthy f places to eat food and buy food and all that sort of stuff. But when we travel like we are now, going to an Airbnb, I'm always impressed, or actually I'm disappointed really, but at all the, it's always the, the margarine. Uh, I can't believe it's not butter. Sure. And this was in New York, it was in Connecticut, like every Airbnb that I go to, it's like they I They have see treats that. out for you, you mean? Like, they have oh, we well, got and, a little and in the fridge back. because other yeah. people have been there right, and they right, leave right. the extra margin and yeah. stuff like that, canola oil. It's just crazy. Like we, we think as, as the more you learn about this stuff and your social networks become healthier, you think, oh, well, no one eats that way. But so many people. The majority. They that's do. That's right. And that's why we have these epidemics. That's why literally there are more people who are overweight and obese in the U.S. than are not. It's over 50% now. Overweight and obese is the majority. And it's because of that very thing you just said. When you look in the fridge, it's full of processed food-like products not food. And that's poison. That's a slow poison. And so if I give you strychnine, I'm going to kill you dead in minutes, right? If I give you cyanide, you're gone. But if I give you canola oil, you're not going to be any, you're going to look fine. You might have a little indigestion. You might have some joint pain, but you're not going to make the connection because it's not immediate, right? It's a slow poison. And so I think we've all been duped into eating these slow poisons thinking that it's healthy. And it's led to all these epidemics of chronic disease that all of our loved ones are suffering from. And it's time for it to stop. I've had enough. It's time for it to stop. And it's time for the regular person, because obviously the experts in the ivory tower, they're not going to hear this right now because you're basically calling into question everything they've ever said their entire career. But if I tell your, my hairdresser and you tell your mechanic they're going to go, oh, okay, I'll give it a try. And then all of a sudden their psoriasis is gone. All of a sudden that knee that he was on the joint replacement list for doesn't hurt anymore. And he calls the surgeon and says, yeah, never mind, right? Magic. That's magic. But it's really not. It's just removing the slow poison. Such a good point. It's funny. I know you've talked about this too, but I do this all the time. Um, if I'm in an Uber or on an airplane, I don't talk about, the people Uber say, what experiment. do you do? I'm like, I'm in sales and stuff like that. And then they'll start talking about nutrition invariably and stuff like that. And, and um, they, they get excited. Yeah, I've heard about this keto thing. I need to lose this belly fat. You know, as an Uber driver, I'm just sitting all day. I said, yeah, give it a shot. You only need it once a day and, and stuff. But anyway, it's really interesting that, yeah. that this is catching on, which is really good. But getting back to what you were talking about with the mindset, you were saying that you really get irritated and fired up when you hear about a grandfather you know, who passed away from a stroke or, or is blind now. Yeah. Do you feel, and this is kind of transitioning as more personal type stuff to figure out what makes you tick. We have a lot of practitioners and nutritionists that tune in and personal trainers uh, want to like pick your brain on that. Do you feel like you have a calling? Like you're here, you're here on this planet to do to influence people, you have this gift and so forth. A lot of people kind of talk about that. I was curious. About yeah, that. I don't know about a gift, but I definitely have a calling. And I definitely feel like it's my job to fix this. And I think every doctor, if he, if he meant his oath when he recited it, should feel that same way. 
And so maybe I'm taking it a little more serious than the average practitioner, but I feel like I took an oath to do that. And that not just to do it to patients who've paid me a copay, but to everybody, because everybody's really a, somebody's patient. Everybody's somebody's mom or somebody's daughter or somebody's son and, or, or father. They all need this information. This is vital information. I mean, we're not talking about how I can increase the long-term percentage of growth of your IRA. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about literal life and death. We're talking about losing loved ones prematurely. What other job does a doctor have than to prevent that? that that's my only job. And so I, I kind of took that seriously, kind of meant that when I said that. And so I consider the, the, every human to be my patient, whether you've paid me a copay or not. And so it's my job to reach out as far as I can reach and to preach as far as I can preach, hey, stop eating the slow poison and stop feeding it to your kids and stop feeding it to the hospital patients and stop feeding it to the nursing home patients. And let's see how much better people get. That's awesome. You know, a lot of people are scared to put themselves out there on social media because they're like, I don't have the credentials or I don't look good on camera, my ears are a weird shape, my forehead's too. Um, but one of the side benefits that I've learned, and I want to see if you, you find this true, is like the more that I put myself out there and like post pictures of the food I eat, the stuff that we're doing, it makes, it holds me more accountable. Mm -hmm. So I can't go out, not that I do smoke, but I, I couldn't go smoke a pack of cigarettes. Right. There's that cognitive dissonance going on. Have you found that a side benefit of like helping other people is that it actually in turn helps yourself a little bit? Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty legit about this stuff. I, I truly believe it and I truly live it on a daily basis. But I think that one thing that posting your, your meals and talking about how you live, because everybody says, I want to see what you eat in a day. And so when you post that, they're like, oh, okay, that's really what he does. There, I mean, you know, we were just at the Cheesecake Factory and I had a huge ribeye and three sunny side up eggs. And then we, I had a bite or two of Nisha's uh, Brussels sprouts. That's what I just ate just before I came here and I posted that on Instagram so that people go, no, he was just there. I'm sure he didn't buy that steak and those three eggs and then throw them away and eat, eat cheesecake. No. And so did I have cheesecake at the Cheesecake Factory? No, I did not. Right. And so I think it helps people to see, no, he's a real guy and that's really what he ate today. And I saw it. And it's, so it's almost like they get to see behind the scenes. Like, okay, because, you know, we've got so many examples of charlatans who were experts in their field, right, who turned out they were full of crap. They weren't doing any of that stuff, right? And I predict that we'll find a few in our sphere as well who turns out, yeah, he wasn't doing that. He was injecting this and doing that and doing that. And we don't know who they're going to be, but they're going to come out eventually because you can't live that life forever in the social media age, right? And so I think it's great for people to be able to see what did Mutzel eat? What did Barry eat? What do they eat? Oh, go to their Instagram. They're showing you right now. And so I think people can learn from that, but also they can rest assured he's true blue. He's really, he's living this. This is not just something he's trying to sell. Such a good point. Uh, I used to be a sales rep outside of Chicago and I went to a, an internal medicine clinic. It was like a integrative, you know, they proposed like, we cure hormone, we do all this integrative mm -hmm. stuff and everything like that. So I went to Whole Foods. I'm like, these guys eat like I do. So I, I brought all this lunch and they're all sitting around like, this is too healthy, Mike. I'm like, what? You're yeah. like on your shingle is integrated functional medicine. You're complaining about that the food was too healthy. I mean, I didn't bring them tofu. I'm bringing them like, you know, there was like some right. fish and some salmon and but you know, anyway, it was pretty funny. No, it's totally valid point. I was at a few months back, I went to a medical conference. And so they always feed us, right? And so everybody else was busy eating the pie. And I was busy on my Instagram documenting all these fat doctors eating their pie. Like that's story after story of, look at this guy, look at this guy, look what they're eating. And I was like videoing all the food. And it's like, yeah, this is what doctors eat. This is why they look like they look. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, all right, let's talk about what makes you tick, your morning routines, your habits, like, like cause you're cranking out content all the time. You're doing these, uh, you know, YouTube lives, Facebook lives, and bringing tons of energy. They're getting shared by tens of thousands of people. Like how do you, what contributes to your success and your energy, you think? I, I believe in what I say. And um, I, I talk about this in the book, but I was raised in a family, very blue collar, very poor. And the, the parable that I was raised on was don't do as I say, do as I do. And the fallacy behind that and the preacher, you know, he got caught in the bar smoking a cigarette, drinking a beer and his congregation were like, what the heck are you doing, dude? And he, his reply was, you do as I say, not as I do. 
And I was taught from a very early age, that's not how a leader acts. That's not how anybody who's anybody behaves. You walk the walk. And so that's, that's kind of hardwired into me that I, you know, if I believe something, I'm not only going to do it, but I'm also going to preach it to the masses and say, hey, this is working for me. This is what I think you should do. And so I think a big part of it is that. And then the second part of it is this gnawing, calling inside me that all these people are getting sicker by the minute and you got to reach out there and get them and help them. And so I think that's part of it. Plus, I really enjoy talking. I don't know if you've noticed that. No, I haven't noticed that at all. <laughs> Just kidding. No, so you got the great book out, uh, Lies My Doctor Told Me. And I think it's being revised and there's a new version as well coming out. And then you have, you're working on a new book with, uh, talking all about diabetes and natural ways to improve diabetes, exactly. blood sugar health. Yeah. Um, we talked about iodine. One of the questions we like to ask every guest on the show is if there's just one herb, nutrient, botanical, or whole food, you're on a desert island, omega-3s, vitamin D, all that stuff's covered, but what's one thing you just couldn't live without? Food or supplement? Food, both. Just one thing you like. No supplement. If all that's covered, I don't need any supplements, but I need ribeye. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just a, just a stash of ribeye. I need, I need ribeye. Yeah, I need meat. I need animals on this island. Is that mm. okay? That's totally fine. And now, if there are no islands, I'll happily eat the veg because that's much preferable to starving to death. But as soon as I can get back to my animal diet, I'll do so. Love it. Um, if you were to bump shoulders with a politician in an elevator and the attorney you said, Dr. Barry, you've been practicing t over 25 years now? Yeah. No, no, no. No, no. I'm not that old. No, I started in, uh, t I graduated in 2000, so what, 18 years? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what, if they said, Dr. Barry, you know, we're, we're, we're losing here at this whole healthcare crisis thing. We try to implement the Affordable Care Act. It's not going so well. What should we be doing? I would say, you know, maybe it's what we're eating. Maybe it's food and maybe we should stop eating food-like products and start eating real food again. Maybe we should start eating the diet that our ancestors ate 5, 10, 15,000 years ago because they did well in a much harsher environment than we live in. Maybe that would help. Love it. So if folks are listening right now, they're walking their dog and so forth, and they want to connect with you, you have a bunch of different platforms. What's the one you would want them to go to? Uh, probably the YouTube channel. I, I probably do the best work there and, and uh, am the most prolific there. And if you just search for Dr. Barry on YouTube, I think I pop up close to the top. Yeah. Yeah, and some of your videos, gosh, on YouTube, too, they're crushing it. That was the, the video that I remember the most, because we all love stories and humor, is, is the joke when, um, who what was it, the American Medical Association said the ketogenic diet is the worst diet. U.S. Ever. News and yeah. World Report yeah. came out with their diet issue, and their, all their dietary experts had decided that the ketogenic uh, diet was the worst diet of all of the ones they listed. And number one, two, three, four, and five was like Jenny Craig, Flex, Flexitarian, Weight Watchers, you know, diets that have been around for literally 20, 25 years and haven't even dinked the obesity epidemic. But, but keto is brand new, but it's the worst one of all. How would you do that video and keep a straight face? I'm pretty good at dry uh, sarcasm. Yeah. Because I was laughing my butt off when, when I was like, I don't know how he did it and not smile because you, and there was- a, Well, you know, the video got a lot of comments. Yeah. And half of the comments were, I hate you. I thought you, I thought you liked keto. I hate you now. Because they thought I was serious. I was too dry. And so I had to change the title, uh, Ninja Level Sarcasm Alert so that people would go, oh, this is sarcasm, because so many people would watch one minute and go, oh, I hate him, unsubscribe. They thought I was serious. But, you know, people love to react. Yeah. Do, you, do you read the yeah. comments? Yeah, yeah. Well, sometimes I do, but uh, I, I get so many now, I don't have time. But every now and then I'll go back just for fun and read and, and reply to a few. But when I first post a video, I try to reply to the first 20 or 30 comments because I want to be responsive, but I mean, I, some of my videos get a lot of comments. So. Mm -hmm. And after a period of time, it's just hard to keep up. It's time hard, from the time it's impossible to keep up, yeah. Uh, but the negative ones, aren't people brutal on YouTube? Yeah. yeah oh man, are. I yeah. try not to yeah. let it get yeah. to me, yeah. but sometimes yeah. I just are. want to write back and I'm like, I need to go take a walk, Mike, yeah. I can't do that. I just that. usually send them a smiley face emoji Yeah. because they need that in their life, I yeah. think. There's a lot of keyboard jockeys out there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and most of them are vegans or calories in, calories out currently. And I, I, let me be clear, I love both those guys and have a lot of respect for them, but they're wrong. But that doesn't mean that we should try to marginalize them or be mean to them. I mean, they. I think that they're thinking, they're just currently thinking incorrectly. But the fact that they're thinking, we should give them respect for that, right? Because many doctors aren't thinking at all. And so at least the vegans and, and the calorie restriction people are at least trying to make this make sense. And what that's ultimately going to lead, lead them to is us.
Right. Which Once, is okay with me, and I'm happy for them to take their time. They'll get here eventually. Totally. Yeah, I like to look at the research at the calories in, calories out model, but what they say, and I've learned a lot about the, these, uh, Doug Hall, there's another, some Dr. Hall, he does all these animal, mo or sorry, um, metabolic ward studies, so mm -hmm. I've learned from that, but it's, I think it's Kevin Hall. It's the same, it's like three days, people are in a, a ward and they're tracking thing, and then that's yeah. it. it it's short term. Short term. Yeah, so. and so as soon as you, if you, when you do calorie restriction, for enough days and enough weeks, your body's not stupid. The human body's very wise and very intelligent. And so it interprets that immediately if there's a famine, right? You're eating low fat and you're calorie restricting. That's, a, that's the definition to your body of a famine. And so it cranks down your, your, your body temperature half a degree. It cranks down all your metabolic processes. And so you just adapt to that. And so, yeah, for the first week or two, you may lose some weight on that, but immediately your hormones jump in and correct all that and your weight loss stops. And anybody who's done Weight Watchers and lost a lot of weight to start with and then immediately plateaued and couldn't lose another pound, that's what happened. Because every diet that US News and World Report says are the top diets are calorie restriction models. And so the only diet that addresses your hormones, that hacks your hormones, is the ketogenic way of eating. And paleo does it a little bit. And if you're a meat heavy paleo, that can do it as well. And so I'm not against any of these other guys. I'm just waiting for them to join us because if they're, if they're truly diligently searching for truth, they're gonna wind up with us. That's a good point. Uh, there was a paper that came out, I think it was in September, and it looked at resting metabolic rate associated with a low calorie diet versus a low calorie ketogenic diet. And there wasn't that suppression in energy expenditure that you alluded to that's normally associated with right. uh, suppressing calories. So I thought that was really cool. Because it's all about the hormones. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I'll put that link in the show notes. But Dr. Barry, thanks so much yeah, for coming on. Pleasure. Thanks so much Thank for you all so you much. do, buddy. Yeah. Really appreciate it. And I'm sure you guys already subscribed to Dr. Barry's YouTube channel. Follow him over on Instagram. There's tons of lives over there. And also on Facebook. Every Sunday you guys do a live. Sunday like every Sunday no matter yeah. what. That's it's right. so cool, yeah. the consistency there. Yeah. Um, and tons of people, I mean, you're, you're sitting there answering questions, like, and there's a bunch of comments coming in. So check that out. And uh, please share this with a friend or family member. Hit that like button. And uh, I'll be following the comments as well on this video. And we'll catch you on the next one. Thanks for tuning in, guys.